Action heroes? We got them. Five of them to be exact, and they're not half bad. Ugh. What are they trying to say? They're not half bad. Are they a quarter bad? Three-eighths bad? This has to be one of the worst marketing campaigns of all time. So now, let's take a quick look at the Charlton Action Hero Line, and you can make the call. Are they not half bad or not? That doesn't sound right at all. I really need to rewrite that. Charlton was the little comic book line that could. Or should I say, they were the little comic book line that could have, but didn't. You see, Charlton Publications printed magazines, and they got into comics as a way to keep the presses rolling. You see, there's a lot of maintenance and waste when a printing press stops. There's wasted ink and paper, for example. Also, presses break down and require maintenance during the process of starting up and stopping. So Charlton decided that they could avoid all this by creating an overnight shift and printing comic books. That way they wouldn't have to waste money and time doing basic maintenance on the press. This decision isn't surprising knowing who the owners of Charlton were. They met in jail. Ed Levy was a lawyer who was serving time for billing fraud, and John Santangelo was an Italian immigrant who was serving a year-long jail sentence for copyright violations. His crime? He began selling simple, typed-out sheets of paper with pop song lyrics on them. And believe it or not, nobody in the 1930s was doing this. He began selling lyric sheets to the top pop songs to record stores across New York City. And he began doing this on a weekly basis with a rundown of the top 10 songs. The record industry discovered this and ran the prosecutors to press charges. Levy and Centangelo were cellmates. Levy, who actually had contacts in the music industry, realized that Centangelo could have made a fortune had he done it the legal way. The two men spent their year-long jail sentence making plans to form a legit publishing company. And when they got out, they started Hit Parader magazine, and their fortunes were made. At one point, Charlton was publishing over 40 magazines a month. And comic books were never their priority. It was just a way to keep the presses rolling and to save money. And this lack of care and attitude created a unique situation for the talent working there. Many top comic book creators got their start and crafted their skills at Charlton. To give you an idea just how important this second-rate comic book company was as a proving ground, future editors for both Marvel and DC got their start at Charlton. Charlton's very first book in 1944 featured superheroes Yellow Jacket and Diana the Huntress, but this was published as superheroes were falling out of public favor. Their go at superheroes wouldn't pick up until the 1960s. The person at the center of Charlton's plunge into superheroes was future DC editor-in-chief Dick Giordano. He began at Charlton as a writer and an artist in the late 1950s, and in 1965 he became Charlton's executive editor. He was the mastermind behind the action hero line. The first major character to make up the action hero line was Captain Atom. Before he co-created Spider-Man and Doctor Strange for Marvel, Steve Ditko co-created The Good Captain with writer Joe Gill. The story of Captain Atom begins when technician Alan Atom is accidentally trapped into an ICBM rocket test heading for outer space. The ground crew finds out that Adam is trapped on board, but they can't recall the rocket. The atomic explosion goes off as planned to the lament of all those back on Earth. Days later, Adam returns to the base with atomic superpowers. The military quarantines him until they can confirm he is safe. They discover that he has superpowers, and the Air Force suits him up and puts him out as their Cold War warrior, Captain Adam. Charlton's most popular character by far was the Blue Beetle. The story of the Blue Beetle is a complicated one both on and off the pages. Charlton gained ownership of this character from shady publisher Victor Fox. Fox used the Blue Beetle as collateral during many of his bankruptcies. In 1955, Charlton published Fox reprints and began creating new stories which gave him Superman-like powers. And that lasted for about a year. A relaunch happened a decade later in 1965 with writer Joe Gill at the helm. He changed the Blue Beetle's alter ego from a police officer who took a super vitamin to an archaeologist who finds a magic blue scarab in Egypt. This new Blue Beetle borrowed elements from the original Captain Marvel. 
His powers were very similar, and the Blue Beetle could travel through a portal to visit and gain advice from a mystical wise wizard pharaoh. When Dick Giordano became executive editor in 1965, he canceled the book. Giordano did not like mystical or fantasy-based characters. He preferred action and science-based heroes. He gave the character to Gary Friedrich and Steve Ditko to revamp. This was at the height of Batmania, and Giordano asked them to create a new Batman for Charlton. The new Blue Beetle was millionaire industrialist Ted Kord. He was friends with the previous Blue Beetle, Dan Garrett. Garrett is killed fighting Kord's crazy mad scientist uncle and his army of robots. With his dying breath, Garrett attempts to give Ted Kord the magic scarab, but due to an explosion in the mad uncle's laboratory, the scarab is destroyed. Afterward, Kord decides to carry on his friend's legacy as the new Blue Beetle. He uses his money and science knowledge to build all sorts of gadgets, including an airship shaped in the form of a giant beetle that he calls the Bug. The question was the creation of Steve Ditko. He took on the duty as sole writer and artist. Ditko heavily peppered the character with his philosophy of objectivism, which gives the character a very dark and cynical tone. He made his first appearance in a backup story in the very first issue of Ditko and Friedrich's Blue Beetle. In this story, television journalist Vic Sage issues out justice to bad guys wearing a mask made of artificial skin. Thunderbolt was the creation of Pete Morrissey. Morrissey was a comic book creator in the 1950s. Morrissey had worked for Lev Gleason and attempted to purchase the character Daredevil after Lev Gleason quit the comic book game. But unfortunately, writer Charles Biro got in the mix and nixed the idea. Thunderbolt's red and blue costume was obviously inspired by the Golden Age Daredevil. Thunderbolt's alter ego is Peter Cannon, the orphan son of an American medical team attempting to bring modern medicine into Tibet. Cannon grows up in a Himalayan monastery where he learns the ancient secret teachings of wise men. The superhero known as the Peacemaker was actually scientist and diplomat Christopher Smith. Smith is a pacifist who is willing to use force for the cause of peace. He works out of a secret fortress called the Peace Palace. He fights all sorts of would-be world conquerors with an arsenal of high-tech weapons. The Peacemaker is the creation of writer Joe Gill and artist Pat Boyette. One of two female characters to make up the action hero line is Nightshade. She made her first appearance in the pages of Captain Adam. She was the creation of Dave Kaler and Steve Ditko. In this story, Nightshade is the daughter of a U.S. Senator and a woman from another dimension. She puts on a black suit and a black wig and goes out and fights bad guys like the Ghost. She never got her own book, but she did have a number of backup stories, and Nightshade eventually became the romantic interest of Captain Adam. The final character to make up the Charlton action hero line is the Judo Master. Set in World War II, the Judo Master would take on the entire Japanese army. After saving the daughter of a Pacific Island chief, Hadley Rip Jagger is taught the ancient martial art of Judo. Judo Master was a creation of Joe Gill and Frank McLaughlin. The Judo Master is teamed up with a kid sidekick named Tiger. In the Nightshade story set in the 1960s, Tiger is her martial arts instructor. Do some of these storylines and characters sound vaguely familiar? Sure they do. With the exception of the Judo Master, the Charlton characters were the models for The Watchmen, which was one of the most critically acclaimed and celebrated comic books of all time. Former Charlton editor Dick Giordano became editor-in-chief at DC Comics. And to celebrate and welcome him into the position, DC Comics decided to purchase the rights to these Charlton characters. Giordano hired writer Alan Moore to write a miniseries to kick off the Charlton characters into the DC universe. What they got instead was this amazing, spectacular script. And DC Editorial loved it, but they felt it wasn't right for the Charlton characters. And they told Moore to go back and create new characters with the script. So, Captain Adam became Dr. Manhattan. Blue Beetle became the Night Owl. The Question became Rorschach. Thunderbolt became Osmond Deus. And a reverse Peacemaker became the Comedian. Moore didn't like the character Nightshade, so he based his character Silk Spectre on the Golden Age superhero, the Phantom Lady. And that's how the Watchmen were born. 
There's a number of other Charlton heroes from the mid-1960s that should not be overlooked. Sarge Steele was a super spy character with a cybernetic hand. He was Giordano's least favorite character. Charlton's only superhero team was the Sentinels, and Helio, Metalla, and the Brute were superheroes by day and horrible Greenwich Village folk singers by night. Then there was also a pre-G.I. Joe military team called the Fighting Five. One superhero who isn't considered part of the action hero line, but deserves special mention is the Son of Vulcan. With the success of Marvel's Thor, Charlton launched their own mythology-based superhero. The Son of Vulcan was the creation of Pat Musilli and Bill Fracchio. News photographer John Mann is taking photos at an ancient temple of Jupiter. At Jupiter's altar, he asks mocking questions of the god Jupiter, and with a flash, he is magically transported to Mount Olympus. Jupiter wants to strike man down for his impudence, but the god Vulcan pleads on his behalf. Jupiter agrees to let him live. Before he returns to Earth, Vulcan makes man a magical suit of armor and weapons. The one thing that has to be mentioned and stressed about this title, the Son of Vulcan series features the very first published work by future Marvel editor-in-chief Roy Thomas and future X-Men artist Dave Cockrum. Unfortunately, the character fell under Giordano's dislike for fantasy-based heroes and canceled the title once he took over as executive editor. So that's it for the Charlton Action Hero line. Were they not half bad or were they not half good? Has DC done a good job with these characters since they acquired them? How would you relaunch these characters? All this and more in the comments section down below. Thanks for watching. Oh, one last thing before I go, there's a couple of filmmakers who are actually making a documentary about Charlton Comics, and they've got a really cool website, and they've got a really cool YouTube channel, and they do a lot of interviews with some of the comic pros that worked at Charlton, people like Denny O'Neill and Bob Layton and John Byrne. You should check it out. It's really cool, fun stuff, and I can't wait to see this movie. Thanks again for watching. Bye, everyone.